Hello. This is a talk for the Autonomous Driving Workshop at ICML 2020. In some ways, this is a follow-up to the talk I gave at the CMU Robotics Institute seminar more than two years ago in April 2018. I will aim to minimize redundancy between these two talks so that if you watch both of them, you will see material that builds on each other and complements each other uh, without uh, boring you and without repeating myself. One thing that uh, I showed at uh, the talk at CMU more than two years ago was this slide. A month before I gave the talk at CMU, Elon Musk said, I think probably by end of next year, self-driving will encompass essentially all modes of driving and be at least 100 to 200% safer than a person by end of next year. That is 2019. <clears throat> We're talking maybe 18 months from now. A month after that, in April, I gave the talk at CMU. I showed this slide and I said that uh, Mr. Musk is wrong and this is not going to happen. There are two takeaways uh, at this point. One is that I was right. The second, perhaps more interesting, is to ask why. Why did this happen? Uh, why did a uh, savvy and genuinely smart person such as, uh, such as Elon uh, could uh, make this mistake? And why uh, it was obvious to some of us that this was a mistake and, uh, and that this prognostication is, uh, is, is not going to, uh, to come to pass, that, uh, that this projection is wrong. A key point that we uh, need to understand is that autonomous driving is a research problem at this stage, not an execution problem. Execution is of course absolutely critical and execution is going to be absolutely essential to the rollout of autonomous driving. But autonomous driving primarily is at this stage a research problem, not an execution problem. Let me talk about a couple of aspects of this. Autonomous driving involves perception-based control of safety critical systems. Now, we have made amazing strides in perception. For example, every time you upload images or video to any of the big social networks, they are being analyzed by some of the most advanced perception systems we have ever developed. They are being screened for offensive content automatically by convolutional networks, and they are being categorized automatically for subsequent association with other content, such as advertising, and categorization for uh, subsequent search and retrieval. So we have scaled up amazing advanced perception systems. However, these systems are not being used in safety critical uh, systems in which they must function under hard real-time constraints where human lives are on the line if the wrong prediction is made. In the settings in which we have deployed such advanced high dimensional perception systems based on modern computer vision, there is a second line of defense. If the system is uncertain, it can hand off uh, its, uh, its predictions, it can hand off some content to human uh, annotators who can uh, screen the content further. And even if a mistake is made, most likely 
uh, human lives are uh, not at stake. Usually, human lives are not at stake. That's perception. Now, control. We have also uh, implemented incredibly advanced control and successfully deployed it in safety critical settings. Landing a spaceship on the moon is an amazing achievement for control engineering. LASIK surgery is an amazing achievement for control engineering. However, these examples of exquisite control do not involve the same kind of high dimensional and extremely fallible perception in the inner loop. Perception of the kind that we see today in the most advanced computer vision systems is not on the critical path of such safety critical control systems. Of course, we do perception-based control. A thermostat is an example of closed-loop perception-based control. A thermostat senses the temperature and regulates it in response. But there is a qualitative difference between these examples and the kind of perception-based control that must be done in ubiquitous deployment of autonomous driving. Societal scale deployment of autonomous driving of the kind that Elon was alluded to where autonomous cars function in all modes of driving and go wherever human drivers can go with the same level of flexibility and robustness. This involves perception-based control where computer vision of the most advanced kind is on the critical path. It's in the inner loop of safety critical control. And we have never deployed a system like this. We have never deployed a system that took such high dimensional and incredibly noisy perception and put it in the inner loop of a real-time safety critical system where human lives are at stake. We actually don't know how to do this. This is a qualitatively new technology that is being developed. Another key point here is that 98% accuracy is not good enough in autonomous driving. And this is very important because in computer vision, for example, culturally, so far, if we've reached 98% accuracy on any problem in any domain of computer vision, as a research community, we have generally moved on. We declared victory. We said that the problem is now solved, it is now boring, and we're going to move on. It's no longer interesting. But in autonomous driving, 98% is not even close to enough. What does 98% mean? To oversimplify a bit, if you drive twice a day to work and back, your regular commute, 98% means that one time out of 50, you have an accident. One times out of 50, if you drive twice a day, is once a month. Once a month, on your way to work or back, you have an accident. And what does 99.8% mean? 99.8% means that roughly once a year, Roughly once a year you crash. Roughly once a year you have an accident. Now, this is an oversimplification, but it illustrates that autonomous driving is a qualitatively different problem from problems that, for example, we have solved in computer vision. It has qualitatively different requirements 
that have not been met so far by any comparable system on any comparable scale. As a historical note, we've had 98% accuracy since the mid-90s. For 25 years now, we've been at 98% accuracy in autonomous driving. In a famous demonstration, CMU researchers Dean Pomerlo and Todd Johem uh, took an autonomous vehicle from the East Coast to the West Coast, from Pittsburgh to San Diego, close to 3,000 miles. 98% were driven autonomously. They had 98% accuracy in autonomous driving 25 years ago. Since I have veered into history, I want to also mention Urs Dickmans, a pioneer of autonomous driving who initiated autonomous driving research in the mid-80s. And by the mid-90s, likewise was demonstrating accuracy success rates that, are, that were in the mid-90s. He had a uh, vehicle uh, drive essentially autonomously from Munich to Denmark and uh, back on the order of 2,000 kilometers, 98% fully on board sensing and computation here. You can see the server rack in the trunk. And in Urs Dickmans's case, the autonomous driving system was in full control of uh, the car. It controlled steering, gas, and throttle full control, unlike the CMU system where only the steering uh, was controlled by the autonomous vehicle. Here you can see real-time tracking and detection of uh, objects on the road in real traffic at high speed. And here you will see this autonomous Mercedes changing lanes, uh, changing lanes autonomously in response to traffic conditions. This is an absolutely fascinating chapter in autonomous driving history. Uh, it is not widely known and not widely discussed today, which is an injustice uh, because uh, Ernst Dickmans really did incredibly prescient, incredibly far-sighted work, and we all should be familiar with it and remember it as we uh, move forward. There is a talk by him that I am linking to on this slide, and I hope that you all will uh, familiarize yourself with this work and remember it for the pioneering uh, work that it really was. After this historical aside, let me uh, come back to the present moment and ask how well we're doing now. If we were at 95%, 98%, 25 years ago, where are we at now? And here uh, we can observe that we don't really know. Nobody really knows because we don't really have objective measures of progress that are reliable and are comparable across different systems and different operators in the industry. What you see here on this slide is the so-called disengagement report that is collected by the California Department of Motor Vehicles that is currently really the closest we can come, the closest we have come to objective assessment of autonomous uh, driving performance. In this report, uh, different operators of autonomous vehicles submit statistics to the California Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, the department collects these statistics and publishes. And what are these statistics? These are the total uh, miles driven uh, by uh, vehicles equipped for autonomy and the uh, average number of miles between disengagements, between uh, occasions in which the human safety 
uh, driver has to take control away from the autonomous system, usually because uh, there is a situation that is, uh, uh, that is dangerous in which autonomous operation is uh, no longer trusted. So for example, here for Baidu, we can see that Baidu in 2019 has driven a bit more than 100,000 miles autonomously, and out of these, uh, perhaps on the order of 20,000 miles, uh, uh, on average, uh, were driven between uh, disengagements. Uh, so this may look good in comparison to, uh, um, to other operators. So for example, here, BMW, you can see has driven um, around 20 uh, miles uh, autonomously and the average number of uh, miles uh, between disengagements was uh, maybe around two or three. Notice that this is on a log, uh, log scale. However, are these numbers comparable? They are not. There is no control over what these miles actually are. You could get incredible numbers by just driving around the block in a quiet neighborhood. You can rack up a huge number of miles with a very low disengagement rate. Or you could drive on a highway in a well-understood uh, domain that by now we have, uh, we have mastered uh, quite, uh, quite well. And likewise have fantastic statistics without actually addressing the core problems uh, that the industry is, uh, is, is confronted, uh, confronted by in a less structured domains. This is a problem. The lack of objective assessment of progress in the relevant domains is a problem that is blocking further progress in this field. The reason it's a problem is because, again, autonomous driving is blocking on research, not execution. At this stage of the field, the basic design of autonomous driving systems is not set. The basic architecture of autonomous driving systems is under active consideration and there is no consensus. There is no agreement on what the very basic architecture of autonomous driving systems should be. This goes to the very core aspects of the design of these systems. What are the modules of autonomous driving systems? What modules should the autonomous driving system be made up of? What are the interfaces between these modules? What kinds of representations should the modules construct and communicate? These are open questions on which there is genuine disagreement between leaders in this field. A particular question that is indicative of the deep disagreements in the industry is, for example, what is the role of HD maps? Should we rely on HD maps and to what extent? This is actually an important question because reliance on HD maps affects the core architecture of autonomous driving systems. Autonomous driving systems that assume the existence of reliable HD maps are architected in a very different way than autonomous driving systems that function purely based on onboard perception. These decisions affect the core architecture, the core design of these systems, and there is no agreement on the answers. When the field is at such a basic, early research stage, the field needs a healthy methodological culture. 
and we know what such a culture should be. We have examples of healthy method methodological cultures that have successfully carried related fields through this growth stage, through this research stage in which basic conceptual questions are being hashed out. That methodological culture is called the Common Task Framework. The Common Task Framework is a core concept in artificial intelligence that we all should be familiar with. It is reviewed quite well uh, by David Donahoe in his survey paper on the first 50 years of uh, data science. David's account follows closely talks that uh, are given on this subject by Mark Lieberman. And I will uh, refer you to Mark's talks. This is absolutely essential material that you all should be familiar with. Mark chronicles the uh, deployment, the development and integration of the common task framework in natural language processing. The common task framework was established in the 1980s in natural language processing with the aim of lifting the field out of the morass that it was in. The morass was that there was no standard evaluation methodology. Different groups were evaluating in different scenarios on different data sets there was a strong demo culture where uh, groups were simply demonstrating uh, their systems in order to impress uh, investors and uh, managers. However, these demonstrations were on different data sets. They were not comparable and uh, the field was dominated by different ideologies that uh, could not be reconciled because each ideology, each fashion, or each uh, glamour and uh, deceit, as uh, Mark and others uh, have called these, uh, each of these could be demonstrated successfully on some boutique data set in some boutique scenario, but the field as a whole was not making progress. The methodological framework that was introduced in response is the empirical culture that we are all familiar with now in computer vision and natural language processing. This is the framework that uses standard data sets, standard metrics, test data that is kept secret that everybody must evaluate on by objective automated systems such that results are posted on public leaderboards where they can be examined by everybody. This culture that many of us in computer vision and natural language processing now take for granted was in fact an amazing achievement that did not come early and did not come easily and was very controversial at the time. However, this is perhaps the single most important factor responsible for progress that we have seen over the past two decades in computer vision and natural language processing. This methodological framework clears the fog that surrounds uh, ideological debates in fields that have not adopted the common task framework. It guards us against inadvertent self-deception 
where we convince ourselves that our favorite pet approach works so well when in fact it does not. And critically, it creates a culture, a community in the field where different groups can see how everybody is doing, can exchange knowledge, can exchange ideas, and can build on each other's progress. Here is an example of healthy common task framework at work. This is the progress in the field of object detection over 10 years. These are results on the Pascal VOC dataset. And you can see accuracy starting out around 17% in 2007 and climbing to around 90% a decade later. Slowly but surely, steadily, the accuracy climbs. This is what the common task framework can do when it is universally adopted. And this is what must happen in autonomous driving if autonomous driving is to get on the same ramp of incremental improvement. This is absolutely critical because the field is now at an early research stage where basic design decisions need to be made based on objective evidence that everybody in the field has access to. As you can probably guess from my talk two years ago at CMU, I believe that Carla, our autonomous driving platform, holds the key to widespread deployment and adoption of the common task framework in autonomous driving. A key reason for the development of CARLA is to instantiate the common task framework in autonomous driving where it is so badly needed. Today, in this talk, I'm going to give you an update on CARLA. I will show you what we've done in the past two years. I will not repeat the basic introduction that I gave two years ago at CMU. I will rather show you what has happened since then. I will briefly highlight research that is being done with CARLA today that tackles these core design questions, these core conceptual questions uh, about the very architecture of autonomous driving systems. And I will announce the CARLA leaderboard. For the first time today, I will show you materials on the CARLA leaderboard, which instantiates the common task framework in autonomous driving. Let's begin with an update on CARLA, taking the presentation at the CMU Robotics Institute seminar as a starting point, not repeating the same material, and focusing on what has happened in the last two years. Let's begin uh, with visual quality. Here is Town 10. Town 10 is uh, the latest uh, environment that our amazing art team has released. You can see here the content of the environment and the rendering quality. This is real-time rendering uh, with Carla today you can see how far we have come in terms of visual quality and visual realism. Our amazing art team has continued to produce materials, open source, creative commons materials that are released openly and freely to the community so that everybody can uh, build on this content and advance the field. You might remember that we released Carla with two environments, Town 1 and Town 2. Well, by now, we are up to Town 10, and we're continuing to uh, create uh, content such as this. Let me summarize some major 
axes of progress in the last two years in Karwa. First, there is content. There is content that we ourselves have developed and released, but perhaps more importantly, we have re-architected Karla to uh, make it easy to use custom content. You can load your own content into Karla. You can simulate traffic in other uh, cities created by various modeling tools. You can essentially load arbitrary cities, arbitrary maps, arbitrary environments on the fly. We have uh, rich and realistic sensors such as LiDAR, radar, IMU, GPS, and very realistic camera models. We have advanced rendering both in terms of visual fidelity, as you saw, but also in terms of speed. And you can now trade off visual fidelity and the frequency of the rendering. So you can render at very high visual fidelity or you can trade off visual fidelity and increase the frame rate, increase the frequency of the rendering. We have re-architected the traffic simulation to make it much more scalable and much more customizable to the point that you can now orchestrate very specific traffic scenarios. If you want a particularly challenging traffic scenario to occur, along the way and you want to train and test your uh, autonomous driving system for, let's say, unprotected left turns, you can do that. You can script traffic scenarios very flexibly to make sure that your driving stack will be subjected to plenty of unprotected left turns uh, along the routes it drives. And Carla, at this point, can function as a kind of hub that uh, communicates information across different frameworks uh, that have to do with autonomous driving, that are involved in autonomous driving. We are interoperable with ROS. We are interoperable with OpenDrive and other standards. Uh, you can uh, deploy and test AutoWare driving uh, stacks, and we are interoperable with traffic simulators that operate on other levels of abstraction, such as Zoom. Let me review a few of uh, these aspects in a bit more detail. Let's look at visual quality again. On the left, you see Town 10 rendered with the uh, rendering that we had last year in Carlo. So this is what Town 10 would have looked like last year in Carlo. That's on the left. On the right, you see uh, rendering in Carlo today after we integrated quite a few powerful uh, rendering uh, functionalities such as atmospheric scattering and uh, mesh distance fields. Furthermore, we have optimized the rendering to the point that you can render, for example, four cameras, HD resolution with this fully featured Town 10 environment on a single gaming workstation with one GPU at 25 to 30 frames per second. So that was real-time rendering of four HD cameras in real time on a standard uh, gaming workstation at 25 to 30 uh, FPS. Let me show you some, uh, some scripting uh, that is quite standard and quite easy in Carla. I like it a lot. So here in the terminal, uh, we're just modifying uh, various things in real time. So we moved the sun below the horizon, which triggered night mode. Now uh, we uh, triggered rain and we made the ground wet all from the terminal in, in real time while the simulator is running. Now there are puddles on the road and there is wind. Next, uh, let's play around with traffic a little bit. So now we're back in night mode and we uh, put cars on the road. Now the cars are driving. 
and now we turned on the lights. Uh, we turned on the, the uh, lights on all the cars. And here you can see the uh, beautiful police car with its light. How nice. Let me show you an example of a uh, content import that I'm incredibly excited about. This is still in the early stage, but uh, you will see an open street map of Manhattan being imported into Carla. So that was a, a selection of uh, Manhattan from open street map. And here is this map in Carla. This is under development. You can see that these, this is just the road layout. Uh, we've only imported the roads, but these are consistent drivable roads that fully reflect the content that is in uh, OpenStreetMap. Of course, we want to build on this and we want to expand this to be a fully featured uh, urban environment with buildings and uh, uh, and everything that makes up uh, the full urban environment of Manhattan. But it's a start. It's a start. Let me highlight some research that is happening in Carla today. And I, on purpose, selected work that is not from our lab. I will highlight work from other labs. I will highlight work that has only been published in the last couple of months to give you a snapshot of work that is being done with Carla right now and is being published in Carla right now. And I will highlight work that is really addressing these core design issues that have to do with coupling perception and control in the way that we need to do for broad deployment of autonomous drive. Here is work from UC Berkeley from Ben Recht's lab uh, that uh, has recently been presented at the Learning for Dynamics and Control conference. And they're asking a core question about perception-based control. Can we have robustness guarantees in perception-based control that we are familiar with from classic control engineering? If we put computer vision in the loop of control and the control system must act on the output of incredibly high dimensional and incredibly noisy perception as we see in computer vision, can we still have robustness guarantees? This paper tries to uh, put together to develop the basic methodology for obtaining such robustness uh, guarantees in autonomous driving. Here is another paper, uh, a joint effort by Oxford and uh, UC Berkeley that addresses a related question. Can we ensure robustness when an autonomous driving system is taken out of the domains that it was trained in? What happens when an autonomous driving system is deployed in a domain that has some uh, structural features that differ from uh, structural features that were present during training? Can the autonomous driving system remain robust? Can we develop training techniques uh, and model architectures that are robust to such distribution shifts. Again, note how this tackles the basic coupling of perception and control that is at the core of uh, the problem. Here is another work from UC Berkeley from uh, Sergey Levin's uh, lab that addresses imitation learning, which is a very pro uh, prominent, very promising approach to machine learning based autonomous driving. And this work aims to make imitation learning more interpretable and more controllable. And that was presented uh, earlier this year 
at the iClear conference. Here is work uh, from Andreas Geiger's lab uh, in Tübingen that also tackles imitation learning and uh, tries to expand imitation learning to make it more expressive and uh, more uh, robust. And here is another work uh, from uh, Andreas's lab that was uh, made public a couple of uh, months ago that looks at the intermediate representations that are pay passed from perception modules to control modules in uh, autonomous driving stacks. And this work asks a very core question, a fundamental question, which is what should these representations be? Uh, what is the best trade-off between the expressive power uh, of such representations and the cost of uh, obtaining them in terms of uh, training data that must be created uh, for uh, training the perception modules that produce these uh, representations. Again, note how this tackles a core design question. What are the representations that are passed between the different modules in the autonomous driving system? We have now come to the CARLA leaderboard, which is an announcement that I am thrilled to make today. The CARLA leaderboard in many ways is what we in the CARLA team have been working towards since the beginning. The CARLA leaderboard operationalizes the common task framework for autonomous driving. Let me review. This is a table that I showed two years ago in uh, my CMU talk, and this is a table taken from the original CARLA paper that was published three years ago. In this table, in the original CARLA paper, we implemented a small set of very simple scenarios and we used them to benchmark a number of autonomous driving systems. And as I pointed out two years ago, these autonomous driving systems did not work well at all. If you analyze the numbers, the numbers are very poor. They're nowhere near good enough for uh, broad uh, deployment. In these two years, amazing progress has been made, in part because there was an objective metric, an objective measure of progress, works from different teams built on each other to the point that we have achieved 100% success rate on all these scenarios that uh, were used in the original uh, CARLA paper. That was achieved last year in uh, a paper uh, that we published called Learning by Cheating that was published at the conference on robot learning. Uh, it's a, a delightful paper with a cheeky title and I can recommend it. Of course, 100% success rate is related to the fact that those scenarios were very, very simplistic. We really did not implement the scenarios that uh, reflect the complexity of real-world driving because at that time, the systems we had access to, the autonomous driving systems we had access to, couldn't cope with even very simple scenarios. Well, that has changed. So last year, as a warm-up exercise towards a standing uh, functional leaderboard for autonomous driving, we have implemented um, what we call the CARLA challenge. Uh, the CARLA challenge was uh, an instantiation of uh, the common task framework in autonomous driving. We released materials early last year uh, there was a period of time in which participants could upload their driving systems to our cloud-based infrastructure 
in which the systems were tested in secret environments that were sequestered, they were withheld, they were never released to the public. So that systems were tested for generalization, for functioning in environments that they could not overfit to, that they could not get access to during training. And the winners presented their work a year ago at a workshop at the CVPR conference. The basic mechanics here are different in an important way from leaderboards that we're familiar with uh, in fields such as computer vision and natural language processing. Because here, it is not sufficient for participants to upload labels, to upload passive data. In fact, participants must upload full functional software systems, systems that must then be run in the cloud safely in new environments that the participants who created the systems did not have access to. This is logistically much more complex and much more expensive than running standard computer vision or natural language processing leaderboards. And we learned a lot from doing this last year for the CARLA challenge. The basic setup is that uh, participating driving systems must drive through a set of routes. They are given a set of routes for training in training environments, and there are seven towns that are available for uh, training, as well as, of course, any environment that any participating team uh, wants to uh, construct. But at test time, the participating systems will have to drive routes in a new environment that has never been released to the public. And we make sure that interesting, challenging, important situations happen along these routes. Our traffic manager injects scenarios stochastically along the routes as the participating autonomous driving systems drive. And what are these scenarios? These scenarios are taken from the NHTSA pre-crash scenario typology. This is a catalog of real world traffic scenarios that most likely, that are most likely to lead to accidents in the physical world. This is a public resource maintained by the US Department of Transportation that catalogs the traffic scenarios that are most dangerous, that most frequently lead to accidents. We used this catalog, this typology, to distill 10 scenarios, 10 scenarios that are representative of uh, the dangerous situations that most frequently lead to accidents in the physical world. And these scenarios are automatically injected along the routes as the participating autonomous driving systems drive in our test environment. Last year, the winners of the CARLA challenge presented their work at a workshop at the CVPR conference. And uh, you can read uh, the uh, uh, paper published by the winning team at this year's uh, CVPR conference. So this year at CVPR 2020, uh, last month, the team that won the CARLA challenge last year wrote up uh, their uh, findings and published it as a paper at uh, CVPR. For us, this was a practice run. This was a warm-up exercise that we did last year to understand how to implement uh, the common task framework in autonomous driving and what issues we will encounter in doing this. Based on what we learned last year, I'm happy to announce that we have now implemented a standing leaderboard that we are now releasing. The leaderboard is now live and I am happy to announce the leaderboard in this talk. With this talk, the leaderboard is officially operational and ready 
for submissions. Let me show you a video uh, that our team made for this occasion that we're all so excited about. This is all rendered in Carla. Here you see a summary of the basic mechanics where uh, participants drive in urban environments and they encounter uh, stochastically uh, these uh, dangerous scenarios uh, that are injected by our traffic manager and the participating systems must deal with these scenarios. There are two tracks. The first is for systems that uh, use purely onboard perception. The second is for systems that rely on an HD map that was pre-computed and uh, provided. The systems are evaluated based on uh, shared objective uh, metrics of performance, the driving score that I will describe in a bit. And you can, of course, uh, make your score public in a public leaderboard. You will see some scenarios now. Uh, so this is a scenario in which uh, you must uh, change lanes when somebody else aggressively cuts uh, in front of you. Here uh, you approach a roundabout and you need to yield. Um, pretty standard uh, yielding situation. Uh, here a bit more dangerously a car is going to pull onto the road ahead of you and you need to notice this and slow down uh, to avoid crashing into it. This is going to be a very, very dangerous scenario that hopefully doesn't happen too often, but we do want our autonomous driving systems to deal with it. This red car is going to drive, run a red light. This red car is going to run a red light illegally in front of us, and we will have to notice on time, slow down, brake, to let this car pass and avoid an accident. It does happen. Here, uh, there is a wet patch with reduced friction on the road, and you will see the car slow down to safely traverse this pass, this patch. The Carla leaderboard is now live, and you can all submit your uh, driving systems to be evaluated. Let me say a few words on the driving score, the metric, because we worked on this a lot. A good metric is really critical for a successful implementation of the common task framework. And a good metric in autonomous driving is challenging because it must reconcile multiple objectives, multiple aspects of what constitutes good driving. After all, you want to get where you need to go. That's part of good autonomous driving. But you also want to do so safely without uh, breaking rules and without causing havoc on the road. How do you reconcile these different objectives and how do you combine them in a single number, a single metric that must assess how well you got to where you need to go in the allotted time while also doing so safely. The metric we've arrived at after uh, a lot of experimentation, including experimentation last year in the Carla Challenge that used a different uh, metric from which we learned, uh, learned a lot. The metric we arrived at for the Carla leaderboard is the driving score, which averages across routes and what it averages is the product of a completion score and an infraction penalty. The completion score is a percentage between one, uh, between zero and 100 that quantifies 
how far along the route you got in the allotted time. If you traverse the whole route and got to the destination, you get 100% uh, on completion. If you couldn't even get started, you get zero. If you went halfway, you get 50. The infraction penalty quantifies how safely you did this. For every type of infraction, the system gets hit with a multiplicative penalty between zero and one that reduces the driving score along these routes. Here, by necessity, we introduced some constants that had to be set empirically. They had to be set basically arbitrarily, but that is part of uh, the uh, nature um, of uh, this game. For example, for a collision with a pedestrian, every single collision with a pedestrian, this really should not happen at all. A good driving system should never, ever, ever collide uh, with, a, uh, with a pedestrian. But in this case, for collision with a pedestrian, your score is reduced by a factor of two. You get hit with a, uh, with a multiplicative penalty of 0.5. For running a stop sign, you get hit with a penalty of 0 0.8. These penalties are imposed every single time. So every single stop sign, every single red light, every single pedestrian, every single collision with a static layout, again and again, you get hit with a multiplicative uh, penalty. Multiplicative penalties are not standard, but we implemented this solution because it keeps the score above zero and gives the participating teams a gradient signal that they can use to improve. Additive penalties, which are more common, can easily underflow to the point that a poorly functioning driving stack will just get zero. If you subtract some number of points for an infraction, it's very easy for a participating system to just get zero points. In this regime, even if the team improves their system by a bit, their score might still stay zero and they will not even realize that they did something good, that they improved their system. With a multiplicative penalty, as we implemented for uh, the driving score for the car leaderboard, participating teams always see some improvement. They always get a gradient when they improve their driving stack. The leaderboard is now live and there is a baseline that we provided with a full starter kit that you can use for development and uh, testing of your own systems. This is the LBC baseline that's currently uh, at a driving score of around 11%. This is based on our learning by cheating paper that was published last year uh, at Coral. This is the work that accomplished 100% success rate on all the scenarios in, that were used in the original Carla paper three years ago. Based on this learning by cheating uh, approach, Brady Zhou, a fantastic PhD student at UT Austin, implemented a full open source starter kit for the Carla leaderboard that you can access here at this link and use it as a starting point for your own entries. It comes with extensive training data that uh, many teams may find useful. Based on the leaderboard, we plan to hold a Carla Challenge 2020 that will be organized in conjunction with the Autonomous Driving Workshop at the Neural Information Processing Systems uh, Conference. Uh, the workshops have not been selected yet, uh, so uh, we, cannot we cannot say with 100% confidence that there will be an Autonomous Driving Workshop at uh, the Neural Information Processing Systems Conference, but if there will be an autonomous driving workshop, 
uh, if the autonomous driving workshop is selected uh, for uh, participation in the neural information processing systems conference this year, uh, we will organize uh, the CARLA uh, challenge at that workshop. And the CARLA challenge this year will simply take a snapshot of the leaderboard. So you don't have to wait. If you want to do well on the CARLA challenge this year, if you want to win and um, be able to say that you won uh, CARLA challenge 2020, very simple, you need to do well on the leaderboard and you need to be number one on the leaderboard. At some point, and we will announce at what point this will happen, we'll simply take a snapshot of the leaderboard and that will be the ranking for the Carla challenge. So if you want to do well, simply submit your driving system to the leaderboard, get your driving score and improve. And we hope that this implementation of the common task framework will catalyze the kind of incremental progress that is behind the remarkable achievements in fields such as computer vision and natural language processing in the past two years. I'm now ready to conclude. I want to thank our team that is behind all the amazing developments that you have seen in this talk. First of all, I want to thank our team lead Herman Ross, who has driven the development of Carla for the past three years. He's been living and breathing Carla, and his passionate passion for this project is evident in the amazing growth of uh, the platform. And our amazing team of developers and artists that have implemented all the functionality that you saw today. To summarize, it is important that we all remember that we are still in the basic research phase of autonomous driving. We are still trying to understand the basic design, the basic architecture of autonomous driving systems. The very core design and architecture questions have not been answered. There is no agreement in the industry on what the basic design of autonomous driving systems should be. This is in flux. This is an open challenge and for fields that are at this basic design stage, it is absolutely critical that the field adopt a healthy experimental methodology that allows different approaches and different quote-unquote ideologies to be measured and reconciled objectively and we know what such experimental methodology looks like. This methodology is known as the Common Task Framework, and it is perhaps the single factor that is most responsible for the remarkable progress that we have seen in fields such as computer vision and natural language processing over the past two decades. And perhaps the single most important problem in autonomous driving today is to implement the common task framework in autonomous driving, because this is the factor that is going to put the whole field on the same kind of ramp that has been responsible for progress in computer vision and machine learning. And I'm happy to say that the CARLA leaderboard, which implements the common task framework for autonomous driving, is now 
life. In many ways, this is what we in the Carla team have been working towards for years. I'm very, very excited that we have reached this stage and I hope that you all check out the leaderboard and if you think you have good ideas about autonomous driving and you want to get objective evidence about how good these ideas are, you should participate, you should upload your driving system and get your driving score. Thank you very much.